Hello, you found the portal. I'm your host, Eric Weinstein, and I'm lucky to be here tonight with Anna. And here it comes, Hachin. Thanks for having me. Oh, did I did I screw that up? No, 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 no. That's right. And Anna is half of the up and coming podcast Red Scare, which has everyone talking. Everyone. Not I don't everyone. Know I'm everyone. exaggerating yeah. slightly. Yeah. Yeah. But it's, uh, I just got introduced to you uh -huh. by uh, a colleague of mine, Blake Masters, who's uh -huh. Peter Thiel's co author. Uh -huh. And I've been addicted to your podcast, not quite understanding why. It's one of the strangest things I've ever found. Can you say more about what induced you to do it and why you think it might be working? Um, I have no clue why it's working. I know that it's probably due to some sort of uh, alchemical, inarticulable thing that's totally out of my control, um, that has something to do with my chemistry with my co-host, who's an actress called Dasha Nekrasova. Um, but uh, I think maybe it struck a chord. I, I know that it consistently infuriates all the wrong people, which was never my intention. It's so innocent, yeah. and that's so beautiful. Yeah, but yeah. it's also not entirely believable, because it does seem like what you're doing is you're crowding out a certain kind of piousness. And we, we had an epic lunch the other day. Yeah, we did. We had a, what they call a power lunch. Is that a power lunch? Yeah, yeah. Okay. I, I, think I, I just learned at the last minute that this podcast is being filmed because I was telling Eric here that uh, the way that we run ours is like a bunch of wires and crap strewn on the floor, like chain smoking. Uh, Dasha literally sits on the ground, objecting, objectifying herself at every turn, and I uh, sit on my disgusting, stained, and cigarette-burned couch. Um, but this is my bad side, and I wish I was more of a diva like Mariah Carey and could demand that we switched seats. Really? Yeah, no, I'm kidding. I'm being hyperbolic. Well, but... and, and we always pick up the syringes before the guests Yeah, are. yeah. Um, anyway, what was the question? Well, the question surrounds uh, what I was going to get at is that we had this bit of a riff where I've said that I'm trying to be long, good, and short, nice. Mm -hmm. That nice doesn't really have a future because nice is really this kind of performative yeah. version that crowds out good. Mm -hmm. And you seem to have, have mastered this form formula where I detect uh, a deeply buried good and there's a, an attack on nice at all times. Yeah, I mean, I think that um, nice on some level is a futile position. I mean, even you look at like female social politics, right? And there's always kind of uh, irrepentant bitches masquerading as nice girls. And then there's nice girls masquerading as irrepentant bitches. And I, I think I would like to think that I'm the latter. Remains to be seen. Yeah, I don't know that I have any sort of earnest or let's say, let's put it this way. I don't know that I have kind of a sustained political vision that I would like to enact. It's kind of out of my control as, you know, my father always used to say, you're but a crumb floating on the face of the earth. But Was it to build your confidence? Uh, yeah, the, it's a, the Russian way of parenting. It's like Russian self-esteem. Um, but at the end of the day, I, I have kind of a very earnest ethical agenda that I'm hoping uh, to populate the minds of my young girl and gay listeners with. I would have said infect, but okay, populate. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, infect is a, another good one. Wonderful. Yeah. Um, so let's let's just get, dig into a little bit of your background as you're mining it yeah. for the kind of motif that even though it's an intrinsically American show, it's informed by this sort of broad Slavic soul. Mm -hmm. And you were born in... In Moscow. In Moscow. Yeah, in 1985, um, the internet and my Spanish Wikipedia says that it's 1986. I, every year I'm aging backwards on the internet. Nice Next year I'll be 32. Yeah, it's great. Um, yeah, I'm like the Benjamin Buttons of neoliberal critique. And But uh, I was born in, in 1985 at the tail end, you know, right before the collapse of the Soviet Union. And there's no way that that experience, along with the kind of uh, inevitable trauma of immigration doesn't inform your worldview. So, if I understand correctly, not only uh, are you coming with this sort of uh, tail end 
uh, Soviet influence, but mm -hmm. it is also the case that you've got access to uh, to the the twin genocides of Jews and Armenians. That's true. Yeah, it, I always say on Twitter, it's very depressing that you know my ancestors survived the Armenian genocide and then the Holocaust, so uh, their uh, descendant could become a podcaster in Brooklyn, now Manhattan. And uh, no doubt, because uh, you're white of hue, you are going to be labeled as privileged because you yes. come from these two yes. ethnic groups, which for some reason we can't actually locate in human history or what these groups have been through, which I find also weirdly yeah. amusing. This is a very, I mean, this isn't a very interesting point. I don't know if we want to, I'm not drunk yet, so maybe we should get into the um, uh, Can intellectual. I, toast to sobriety? Yeah, yeah, let's toast to sobriety. To sobriety. Yeah. Um, the Zdorovia. Um, you, I don't, so I'll get into all the kind of like um, heavy handed intellectual stuff in the first half, let's say. But this is one of, I think, my central projects or critiques that I'm interested in. Uh, I don't, obviously, I don't dispute the completely gross, horrific legacy of American slavery, right? It existed, it plunged an entire population into poverty into uh, social fragmentation. The, the legacy is still alive and well today. Um, what I object to, I think, is the wholesale export of the American uh, view of race relations to elsewhere in the world, to people who don't have the similar experience. Well, I guess, from my perspective, what I find very odd about all of this is that having been close to people in the Armenian and Jewish communities, there's a tremendous amount of intergenerational trauma. Yes. Because there has to be. Yeah, my sister and I call, call it hand-me-down trauma. Yeah. It's something you inherit, you know, like a, a brooch or like a necklace. Well, I would say it's also a set of behavior patterns yeah. for detecting when things are starting to get really dicey. It's yeah. sort of like you have to know that, um, it's not that the generation that goes through these things is the only one that has a claim. The longevity of these populations is about saying, we don't know whether there's gonna be another one of these episodes in your time, mm -hmm. so everyone always has to be ready. There's no yes. state of not being ready. Like, we've made it. We finally, yeah. we're, we're orthodontists, we're gonna be fine. Yeah, I mean, you, you can't rest on your laurels effectively. And I think- You have to sleep with one eye open in yeah. some sense. Well, yeah, the, uh, you know, you, you, with a knife under your pillow. You're going to give away all of our secrets? <laughs> yeah. Um, I have so many dark family secrets. But um, the I think the basic correct uh, principle, the, the basic critique of um, certain, I guess, leftist intellectuals in the United States is this idea that, okay, well, uh, somebody like me is not only white, not only would be associated as white or would consider herself white, but is essentially white passing. So therefore, even if I was not hypothetically white, I could rake in the certain white privilege that, for example, or a, a black or Latino person couldn't. Well, this is what I've called the intersectional shakedown. Yeah. And the, the populations that are, <laughs> are maximally irritating to the in, intellect, uh, intersectional shakedown artists are the populations with recent claims to oppression that are nevertheless making it economically. Because really what it is, is an attempt to take a real history of oppression mm -hmm. and to turn it into cash. Yes, well, yeah, I tweeted literally today, moments before I um, came here, that the kind of idea of cultural pro appropriation, that debate makes perfect sense in a, a culture where uh, identity is viewed as a form of capital because it becomes then a zero sum game. If somebody like uh, uh, Rachel Dole is all right, right. Uh, perpetuates this myth that she's a black woman, she is basically taking food out of the mouth, power out of the hands of an actually black woman. Right, so there's that absurdity, but then we actually have to contend with the weird aspect, for example, if you look at the exploitation of black musicians mm -hmm. who very often, you know, at some point you had a lot of uh, illiterate, um, genius musicians in the Delta who are mm -hmm. brilliant enough to produce great music, but weren't capable of defending themselves in a legal structure. Right, exactly. And so you actually had cultural exploitation of one group by another through appropriation. So you'd get, 
you know, I, I think at some point I saw Otis Blackwell performing in New York City mm -hmm. and, you know, he had to say, look, I'm the guy behind Elvis Presley. Right. And the idea is that when Elvis sang it, it was acceptable to a market that he couldn't sell into. Uh -huh. So there is a real aspect to cultural appropriation and there's a totally fake aspect. Yes. Which is yeah. this sort of, and they're coexisting. And so I it's very tempting for people like us just to point at the bullshit. Yeah. But there actually is this unfortunate reality that's braided with it. Yeah, absolutely. No pun intended. Um, sorry. Oh, the braids? Uh, the braids, yeah. The box braids. Um, no, but it's it's uh, absolutely true. I mean, you can give the example of like Hesh and the Sopranos, right? We talked about the, the Sopranos at our power lunch. Um, who's the, this guy who's kind of this like kindly sensible Jewish grandfather. Within they, a mafia context. Within a mafia context. Is war so warm and loving and steadily and this is a guy who has historically stiffed black musicians for royalties right and there's that famous reparations episode with uh, i think it was bokeem woodbine playing the the rapper mini gark guy well, there's a question about whether he's going to visit violence upon him but it turns out he's going to visit a lawsuit yes or yeah, 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 yeah exactly but then you have like these um cultural examples of like you know like Katy perry or uh uh Miley Cyrus wearing cornrows, like Kim Kardashian wearing cornrows in a um, Kardashian like beauty photo shoot, which I find completely preposterous. No one owns cornrows. I don't know enough about well, nobody, female hairstyle. There's no direct line of monetization, right? Okay. I don't see it that way. And so that that's a, a discourse that I think, yeah, you're right, exists as like a proxy discourse because people are afraid to confront the deeper, more complex issues. Well, I think that, and you have one set of legitimate issues acting as the stalking horse for this uh, infernal shakedown. And my, my hatred of this comes from the fact that if, if American Jews who have made it financially yeah. in one generation are somehow safe and secure and therefore privileged, mm -hmm. something is entirely broken with your cosmology. Mm -hmm. Well, how do you mean? Well, it's just like, I assume that the German Jews in the, you know, before Kristall, the, the two nights before Kristallnacht were privileged yes, and should yeah. be worried about their privilege. It's just, this is stupid. Yeah, it's a silly argument. And I think, you know, I get into spats about this and I'm, I'm frequently accused of like being racially insensitive. And I, you know, as Quentin, the late great Quentin Tarantino said, I reject that hypothesis. It's patently false. What I've always said is not, I'm not in the business. I'm not interested in having an oppression Olympics and saying like, well, okay, look, I come from, uh, a historically oppressed background on two sides, but yeah, I, you know, grew up in a, well, I, totally I middle class milieu and you know but i'm going to use this kind of identitarian card i'm going to play the card to be oppressed that's not at all what i'm interested in um what i'm saying is that as a person who comes from a, a different culture i can view the legacy of american slavery at a critical distance in a way that american people may not be able to Right, because in in Russia you have a parallel system called serfdom. Right, these the slaves and the serfs were emancipated within I think well, a year of each other. Right, but I mean I just had uh, J D Vance in your chair. Uh -huh. uh, I've heard only horrible things about him. Oh, yeah, I'll introduce you. Yeah. I like him quite a bit. Um, he, you know, his family, of course, is coming from Appalachia uh -huh. and hillbillies were de facto enslaved, uh, maybe a form of light slavery, if you will, just mm -hmm. we served them as a different form of enslavement mm -hmm. um, with company towns, company script, company stores, company housing, private armies of detective agencies. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the idea that that is seen through the lens of white privilege shows you the imp mental impoverishment of the current woke ideology. And mm -hmm. my claim is that we, we cannot afford to dispute it. We must ignore it just because it, it sort of shouldn't qualify intellectually. Like it didn't make. Uh, I mean, as, as uh, George Bush, the second said, you don't negotiate with terrorists. And this is, I think my big opposition to it is that woke ideology by and large is an emo is um, an emotion like an emotional hostage situation it really is it's a it's a hostage crisis yeah well you, you seem to not you seem to be ignoring the credible threat to your reputation in fact it's making your reputation yeah but so you're metabolizing this kind of um 
weird resentment and hatred um, that people are experiencing through fear because these are reputational attacks. In general, yes. they, they're attacks that say, I'm going to make it impossible for you to earn a normal living by by making an attack on the, your reputation, which you need to negotiate right. the institutional world. Yeah, and it's like, you know, it's Jordan Peterson famously said, like, I've figured out a way to monetize the SJWs. And, you know, you could possibly say that about Red Scare, but that it's not kind of... No, I think you guys are doing something much more bizarre and interesting. Yeah, yeah, I agree. But it's not intended in that way. But that that was never the premise or the interest. It was kind of this earnest... It was truly kind of an earnest frustration with liberal mainstream feminism and liberalism. I don't even know whether it's liberalism. I mean, like everything is so watered down and, and metastatic and bizarre. Yeah. That it's the vague whiff of the left gone mad. Yeah. Right? Like it's not liberal. It's not progressive. We don't even know what it is. It just sort of technically yeah, resides it's not to the left. conservative either, right? No. You can't rightfully call it that. Um, self-hatred is obviously a very large part of it. I think, I, yeah, self-hatred. I mean, this is a, another kind of, you know, I repeat myself loudly and often. Um, well done. According to the advice of my hero, Quentin Crisp, who said that that was kind of the way to be make yourself memorable. And um, it the problem with the left, and I'm talking about kind of primarily the online left, is that these are people who are thoroughly infected with the virus of uh, the neoliberal ethos. They're completely, they play completely within the terms of the system. And, you know, it. this brings to bear a very important point that I also like to repeat loudly and often by the new left critic, Christopher Lash. Um, and I'm going to paraphrase it because I don't know it verbatim because my synapses have been uh, zapped by being too extremely online, you know. Um, but he said, like, hey, you know, all the kind of traditional uh, bedrocks, all of the traditional values and institutions of liberal society, um, we're talking about monogamy, marriage, uh, the gender binary, um, any number of other kind of traditional values have already been been dealt a serious blow by advanced capitalism itself long before the social justice activists got their hands on them before they mounted a fight against them and that's a very important point to remember so the way i see it and, and you'll let me know if this dovetails or in fact conflicts or maybe it's just mm -hmm. total miss is that the family and the religion mm -hmm. or culture mm -hmm. provide many of the same things that the market provides, like let's say an insurance policy, mm -hmm. right? So for example, um, if you're trying to smooth your income stream over a lifetime and you have recessions, a family might take in some members who are out of work and right. put them to work in portions of the family business that are still functioning or work inside the home. Mm -hmm. um, in a way that sort of socializes some of the risk. And at the same time, you might buy some kind of a, a policy to try to smooth things out, you know, or, or, you, or you'll, you'll try to save uh, in an institutional context. As these things conflict, um, the market has denatured some of these older structures. When people talk about American families are weak, Mm -hmm. What they usually mean is, is that American markets have been regular and strong enough mm -hmm. that people have leaned less on the mm -hmm. pathologies of their mishpucha mm -hmm. uh, in order to try to get cleaner expressions within the market for, mm -hmm. for their various needs. Like instead of having, you know, a mother uh, come and be with a child when a new baby is to born. To your laundry. Yeah. What? Yeah, to do yeah, your laundry. Yeah. That you hire somebody to do it. Mm -hmm. And the idea is if the market is working in some sense, yeah. the family starts to fall apart because you don't need it. Right, exactly. Yeah. And, you know, people are smart. They know that like seven, eight years of psychoanalysis is a very tall price to pay for having your mother come every week and do your laundry. It's an interesting And they'd period. rather be, yeah. Um, and there's this, you know, whole rhetoric now about a work-life balance, whatever. And I think that 
the, the the market part of the kind of psycho let's say like the, the psychological anima of the market is that it provides people yeah with a a scaffolding and, and infrastructure through which to relieve themselves of their family. Right. So one of the, um, one of the things that's interesting to me is, is that you're coming from a background, which is very familiar to me where you have a Jewish Armenian uh, parentage and your father is a famous mathematician working in linear programming, mm -hmm. sort of optimization mm -hmm. science, and came up with um, this amazing algorithm that changed our picture for how things could be optimized using smaller and smaller ellipsoids. Right. And your mom, how did she figure into the story? Um, I, I, my, my dad, uh, his whole kind of uh, level of achievement is way over my head, obviously. Um, but uh, my my mom and my dad, I mean, they met when they were very young and they got married quite a bit later. My mom, I think, uh, would probably be very irate and disappointed if I described her like this because you know she's going to listen to this. Um, she is an artist but I, who became a housewife, basically. Okay. And I think that she is the great genius of the family. She's the, the great kind of organizing and destructive force in my family. Well, it's interesting, very often um, in the, so I, I have to say that when we had this lunch, which you're describing as a power lunch, yet yeah. I drank no alcohol during yeah. it, so I'm not positive that it qualified. Well, I, I mean, are you supposed to drink alcohol? I don't really know. It okay. would be my first power lunch. Oh right! I have to. I, it's just you know a stupid uh, girl bossy hyperbolic term. I have I to. See. I have to drink. Okay. Well, very and good. And smoke at all lunches. I didn't smoke. You didn't smoke. But I'm such a neurotic. I'm so shy. I was telling you that I can't. You know, I have to constantly occupy. Uh, Is that because my... you're reveling in your neuroticism? No, no, no. I'm not like a Woody Allen person. I don't okay. get off on it. Oh, you sure? It's something that I hope to to shed with a. Okay. Uh, the kind of accumulation of experience, like habituation. Okay. Yeah, that's not something I think you should look up to in yourself. I don't know. Um, but yeah, I think that uh, my mom is kind of like a bizarre, freewheeling artistic genius, um, a true eccentric. And I think that I derive a lot of my personality and my tendency toward critique from her. I mean, she's always spinning paranoid polemics about the world it's really quite impressive and she's right most of the time i think it's very strange that i mean this really actually echoes your earlier point that we tend to see accomplishment only if it shows up in the workplace mm -hmm. and for a lot of us coming from kind of ethnic families for lack of a better word very often people who were inside the home were well known to be the local genius mm -hmm. or the eccentric or the life or the whatever. Mm -hmm. It was not clear in any way that uh, if you were the Shmata salesman, that that was really the higher expression mm -hmm. of the two people in a marriage. Mm -hmm. And it happens that your father did something very creative yes. in a very analytic context. Yeah, yeah. It's hardly surprising. Like there's nothing at all surprising to me that your mom might mostly be at home with the family and be, the major force of the family. Yeah, and I think like you know my my dad probably gets all the credit for um be for uh being kind of the genius. Um my haters like to point out that I'm coasting off of my father's accomplishments, which is not true because I'm actually way more famous than him on Reddit. So there dad. Yeah, there you go. Um <laughs> he would be so uh I I'm here to disgrace my family name. Um but basically i think that it's a very interesting this this kind of old breakdown of my parents marriage is a very instructive example of the way that women wield unofficial power through the domestic sphere again it's like unofficial like, the language is even wrong to me it's like in what world do we not I guess the idea is that it's official if it shows up in Wikipedia and it's unofficial if it only shows up in family I, lore. I think it's official if you're getting officially compensated for it, right? Okay, well, this yeah. is the issue of kin work that I would yeah. bring up, which is that I think that a lot of the um, wage gap work is extremely weak and manipulative, but I think it's also the case that the real wage gap is that you have to figure out how to compensate uh, 
for kin work, you mm-hmm. know, taking care of uh, of elder relatives or young children, mm-hmm. and that you can arguably say that women should be paid more on average because that is uncompensated work and it has mm-hmm. to show up somewhere. And sometimes it would show up in like prestige. The matriarch of a, of a, of a large family is kind of a, an impressive position to right. hold. And that with smaller families, it's no longer so cool to be grandma. Yeah, sure. And I think that there's a general disrespect for the institution of motherhood. Let's, let's talk a, about that. What the hell is that? In the culture at large, particularly on the left. So that this is something which I totally resonate with. Like, when did the left go? And, and they, they're going to claim, oh, we're not anti-family, but there is some weird anti-family thing. Um, I think that that's absolutely a kind of collective defense mechanism because we're talking about people much like myself who are millennials in their late 20s, early 30s. Um, you know, my father always used to say like, well, Anna, you can't really ascend in class you know, contrary to the myth of the American dream, but you can't really fall in class either. And now we're faced with a generation that's quite a bit like the lost generation in, in Russia, my father's generation, all of whom who drank themselves to death by the age of, you know, 52, um, uh, which is this millennial generation of people like myself. So who, your, your dad was two years younger than I am now when he died of a heart attack. Yes, yeah. Um, and, you know, he died in, in the United States, but I think that he is part of the same generational trend what year was that in uh 2005 um but uh, there are a lot of people my age who are confront male and female who are confronting for the first time the reality that they will actually um fall in class and especially relative to their parents they will yeah. never own property they will never pay off their student debt they will never have a, a safe and dependable health care situation they will never be able to afford children and i think the kind of a- broadly anti-natalist trend on the left is a psychological defense mechanism because you have to reframe i think in the neoliberal framework you have to reframe all adversity as opportunity and uh, what they're saying to themselves what do you want to, i don't have to be burdened by babies yes. my, my breasts will be undeformed by breastfeeding yes i'm a girl boss i don't need a man i'm an mm. independent strong independent right. woman um uh, so they've had to kind of recalibrate. by the way this will work out for a minority of the people who claim this to be true right it's not bs what's it's bs is how broadly this plan is likely to work. Yeah, how applicable it is across. I mean, I started noticing, I actually got a lot of flack for this and I I still don't know why. I started noticing in the pop lyrics of the last two decades or so, kind of minute shift. Um, You can go back as far as actually the 1960s. I remember this interview with Amy Winehouse where she's like, you know, I I, I much more prefer, I gravitate toward the music of the 60s, uh, the 50s 60s whatever uh, as opposed to the music of the 2000s because in the kind of female vocalists of the 60s they expressed kind of a longing a, de- a yearning for companionship and love a desire to subordinate themselves to the will of others or something greater than themselves let's put it that way that feminists have interpreted as a fundamentally kind of misogynistic or sexist outlook Whereas now, you know, with the, the coming of somebody like Beyonce, you have these lyrics that literally are like, I don't need you. I don't need a man. All men are trash. I'm going to keep stacking my bills. And it's it's this form of feminism that I find to be very callous and cretinous and ultimately counterproductive. Actually, I mean, let's, let's take what you just said. It was actually weirdly... Uh, on both sides of the gender aisle. For example, um, let's say John Denver, um, when he sings about, uh, you know, it's a kiss me and smile for me, tell mm-hmm. me that you'll wait for me. He talks about, um, when I come back, uh, I'll bring your wedding ring. Mm-hmm. Like he's excited about the fact that he's screwed up in this relationship. Mm-hmm. He says, I've played around. And then he says, uh, but I, I realize how important this is and I'm going to make it right. And I'm Mm -hmm. excited about becoming betrothed to you. Right. I'm going to make amends. Well, not only make amends, 
you know, like when Beyonce, I mean, just to, to, to connect these two data points, she's saying, if you like it, you should put a ring on it. Like mm -hmm. she, that's really what she wanted. Mm -hmm. But like, you didn't, you didn't exercise your options, very transactional. Mm -hmm. So now I'm up, I'm up in the club getting jiggy with this other guy. You shouldn't be upset. Yeah, yeah, sure. It's, it's, it is a very kind of transactional ethos that permeates all, like there is this like, kind of stupid trend on Twitter where people or, or, that people were mocking because um, other people were tweeting out kind of empathy templates. So, you know, if somebody texts you and they're like, Hey, I'm like really going through a hard time. You know, I'm having a, get, getting a divorce. My mom's dying of cancer or whatever you fire back with like, Hey, I'm currently at capacity. Do you know somebody else who slash I'm going through some personal problems to slash. And it's like a kind of prefabricated template for how you should respond to a person in need. Wow. Yeah, this, this no, is I the thing. I didn't know this is how yeah, we do you're it so now. Lucky. You're, you're so lucky that all this stuff is way over your head. I have to live with this every day and it shrinks my will and libido to live. But it's like this kind of thing that um, is hyper transactional. All relations have become so transactional. All relationships, I mean, look, my take on this is that all relationships have an aspect of exchange right but that what distinguishes the transactional from the rich relationship is how many layers of indirection separate uh the people involved right. from the exchange yes so dinner in a movie is a lot more abstract than turning a trick on a street corner yeah and then you you go further you know with courtship it, it becomes incredibly distant in uh -huh. terms of the number of layers and what we don't recognize is, is that those layers of indirection are essential to a rich life. Yeah, and a rich emotional life. And what we're dealing with now are people who, if they are not economically uh, impoverished or spiritually impoverished, because they have no institutions or values uh, on which to depend. Okay, so... This gets me back to like your crazy podcast yeah. and your persona. So first of all, I mean, you're playing with all sorts of associations and breaking them in ways that the indicia and the underlying, like the proximate and ultimate are separated. Mm -hmm. So I normally associate vocal fry and up talking with stupidity. Right. I don't associate it with your level of insight and commentary. Right. You guys sound stoned out of your mind. Uh -huh. And there's a tremendous amount of vocal fry, but it, what it speaks to is this like crazy metacognitive distance that you and your co-host have mm -hmm. from the topics that you're discussing. Uh -huh. And you're sort of, you're constantly bemused by this sort of very weird period of the human condition. Is that wrong? Um, I think bemused is a nice way of putting it. I think that we're, nice. we're very frustrated. What do you want? I I don't know. We're we like all women. We don't know what we want. No, I mean, I think I want. I think you do know what you want. I think I want. I mean, on a on a kind of broad social level, I think that we have to take kind of the old Nietzschean adage: "God is dead." Right? Um, people always interpret that as. Um, you know, I think people have a tendency to interpret it as God is dead, and therefore we can get like weird septum piercings and tattoo sleeves and go fucking and sucking in polyamorous arrangements. And that's not at all what he meant. He meant God is dead and now it is up to secular humanity to replace the value system that was evacuated with the death of God with an equally viable one. Do you think that's possible? No, I don't know. But I, you know, what else can we do? You know, Dasha always says to me, like, you have to stay cheerful in the face of adversity, like the Greeks. Yeah. Well, all right. So, I mean, in part, uh, and I don't know how long the show is going to get away with it. Yeah. But um, ultimately, it's about, for me, recognizing what the religious impulse was. It was a load-bearing structure of our civilization because it caused you to think in intergenerational terms, like in our the shared part of our tradition, the Jewish tradition, mm -hmm. the concept of generation to generation goes under the name Lador Vador mm -hmm. from generation to generation. And that thing about you have to be seeing yourself, you have to subordinate and submit 
And like, this is against the ethos of our time, but it, it, it occurs everywhere because our soma, the, the uh -huh. parts of us that are non-reproductive are finite. Right. They always die. Yes. And if you do not link yourself in a chain with others, then Rome has to be built in the day because yeah. there's nothing more. Over for you hoes, as, as we say. Uh, well, that was yeah. far more eloquent yeah. than I had said. Yeah, but I, I mean, it's true. And look, I mean, investing or kind of honoring posterity is a means of investing in the future. It, yeah. it, it's a means of envisioning yourself in a greater human chain, a human centipede of drudgery and debauchery. No, but, uh, and what's lost now, I mean, this is like the, the cardinal sin, right? Uh, in kind of neolib uh, in neoliberal discourse is subordinating your will to somebody else. It's bizarre. And to see this kind of ethos then flourish on the so-called left is profoundly dispiriting. Well, it's it's such a simplistic version of empowerment. Yeah. And it's, it, you know, it's one of the things that I've advocated repeatedly. So in terms of, I, I, I'm going to take your adage and start mm -hmm. repeating myself loudly and often. Mm -hmm. I keep saying that magic happens when people pass power back and forth. If you right. retain all your power, then you don't get to the magic of giving your power to somebody else and having them give you an equal amount, you know, of a different kind yes. back. And so we never actually build those super powerful relationships um, when we're hoarding our power saying, I'm not gonna give anything up. Mm -hmm. um, you're interested in motherhood, like for yourself. For myself, of course, but in general. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think this is the most kind of noble, honorable institution on the planet. And it really matters. I mean, this is one of the things that uh, a family friend is very dear to me, took me aside at some point and said, um, you wanna know something magical, look at your children. That's what happens when a PhD stays home to raise them. Yeah. You know, and yeah, it was just like- Are you getting a little verklempt? That's beautiful. I get, too, yeah. I get, <laughs> I get way too verklempt yeah. on this show. This is, yeah. 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 But it's, you know, my wife was out of the workforce for like 10 years or yeah. something. And you know she came back, you know, with 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 mentally guns blazing. Yeah. But I think that this hatred of motherhood uh, has to be acknowledged. First of all, it's denied. Mm -hmm. Well, we don't hate motherhood. We just mm -hmm. think it's about choice. But mm -hmm. you look at it: the mommies who work and the mommies who don't. Mm -hmm. One gender is built to reproduce our species, mm -hmm. and I just. I can't stand what we've done to, to it. Yeah, and it, there's a kind of no honoring also among men or women of the gender difference, which exists. It's very real and palpable. And um, I think uh, feminists uh, have this idea that um, if we acknowledge that we're different, we're acknowledging that we're unequal, and that's not at all the case well, we're well, differently equal we're differently abled <laughs> well, so this is the weird thing if you try to make this argument at the level of like racial groups mm -hmm. or geographically separated groups there really isn't a great way of saying that there should be equality because there's no reason that mm -hmm. separated groups should have variables having common means mm -hmm. within a group there actually is this weird principle of, of fisher the a biological theorist, mm -hmm. which says that it is as good to be female as male from the perspective of the fitness of the two genders as strategy. Right. And the problem with it is that you have to, you ha what, what fails is what you might call um, the Ginger Rogers principle. So mm -hmm. the old, as the joke goes, Ginger Rogers could do everything Fred Astaire could do, but backwards and in heels. Mm -hmm. And the feminist version of this is women are as good or better at everything men can do except peeing standing up. Mm -hmm. And that can't possibly be the case if Fisher's uh, theory is to hold mm -hmm. because then women would simply be better. Yes. Unless peeing standing up was like the be all and end all, which I mean, it's, it's yeah, pretty yeah. good, but it's not that yeah. great. Um, that's part of the problem, which is if you, if you claim that you're better at something, biology tells you you have to be worse at something else. Right, so that there's a kind of an implicit trade-off, right? Or, or or balance, let's say. Well, then it gets to this really, like, here, here let's get into trouble with psychologists and psychiatrists. Okay. Um, 
the whole codependence concept, yes, there is something which is really dysfunctional, mm -hmm. but a lot of interdependence is labeled as codependence. Mm -hmm. And the modern notion that you should be a completely functional person who can do everything and able to walk out on a moment's notice, mm -hmm. that completely destroys the concept of coupling. Yeah, I mean, I think this all goes back to the atomizing logic of the market and all my big issue, I think, uh, my big critique, kind of the central organizing theme of my my work, right, is this idea that uh, progressive activism is now effectively marching in lockstep with the, the very market. market imperatives that they are opposed to on the face of things. It's maddening. Well, and it's so, in, it's so intellectually incoherent. It's kind of amazing that it's still hanging together as a pseudo philosophy. Yeah. All right, so now like, I feel like you're revealed, you're somehow reveling on your podcast and this like really dangerous kind of memes, mm -hmm. um, which suggest, you know, know, royalty plunged into uh, boredom and cocaine mm -hmm. and, and, and wanton sexuality. Mm -hmm. But in fact, underneath it, you're coming from an academic tradition mm -hmm. and, you know, embracing very traditional values mm -hmm. there's no reason to leave left of center thinking because traditionally what it, what has the left been it's been about empowering working families right and that's what i'm interested in it's funny that so many of my critics and i if you really look at us it's like you know the narcissism the narcissism of small differences like we are co completely indistinguishable to like an uh, afghani fig farmer yeah you know 99% of our politics are equivalent. Are they? I'm sure. I mean, like... Who are you pissing off, you know? I think, uh, I think people that kind of are self-identified as leftists, um, but are basically, and I say this with the most, em like the, the most empathy possible because I understand their position, uh, I feel completely insecure and precarious in the market. They feel that they have no future. I, up until a year or two ago, felt that I have no future. It was really a toss up. Okay, you so know? you talk, what happened when you got a future? I mean, I started this podcast. And I know, it, but it, I mean, what, what happened to you? Did you have a physiological change? Um, physiological? I mean, like when, I, I've, when I've been shit out of luck. Yeah. And then I get some luck. I'm, the chemicals that are running through my body are totally different. Yeah. I mean, you start to even like look more like resplendent and wonderful and whatever, but you get plumage. Yeah. You get plumage. I think like, but this is the first time I mean, I'm 34 years old. I'm kind of like an old geezer by millennial achievement standards. You know, it's like you have to be like 23 when you peak or something. Um, and, but again, I'm merely an individual, right? And there's a, a whole generation of people who are like now left behind. Do you, do you know my friend Peter Thiel at all? I mean, not personally. So he's got a great quote. I don't know whether he yeah. said it publicly, probably yeah. has, but he says things to me and I just, I kick myself for not having thought of them first. He says a boomer's uh, golden era is in his or her twenties. Mm -hmm. A Gen Xers in his or her fifties. And then he looks at me and he says, and we're just getting started. <laughs> it's been, it's like, I didn't get suddenly interesting like in the last few years because I ate a mushroom. Yeah. It was, you, there's this thing I've called the distributed idea suppression complex or uh -huh. the disc. Is, is this your coinage? Yeah, I coin lots you, of yeah, stuff. Yeah, you coin a lot of, yeah. Yeah, but then you, the weird thing is you watch it in the world and it, it only works if you're coining something that people actually recognize yeah. as real. It's not like you can make up anything and it, it just goes. Yeah. But th there is this thing that tried to suppress all ideas. It's still working. Like they're trying to make Andrew Yang not appear on MSNBC on any of the graphics or okay. Tulsi gets you know dropped at every opportunity. Yeah. This thing just doesn't want to hear that there's a massive intergenerational transfer where the two vampiric generations of the silence and the boomers transfuse the Xers and the millennials in order to allow them to live in the style to which they become accustomed. And uh -huh. like the most obvious place that you see this is the university system. Explain that. Oh, it's a I pyramid. Mean, on the it was a pyramid scheme that was expanding. Mm -hmm. And when, when the growth that was natural in the system ran out, mm -hmm. the, there was no way to give people professorships who had been contributing their youth 
to the research of those above them. Right. And so what the universities did, almost every top university loaded up on administrators and then made tuition insanely expensive and yeah. made it impossible to, to get rid of the debt in bankruptcy mm -hmm. so that you can die, uh, you know, getting a social security check and still paying your student loans. Mm hmm. Um, I'm going to do a show, hopefully, with uh, Sugar Baby University, which is a program inside of uh, Seeking Arrangement mm -hmm. Sugar Dating, Okay, where it would appear that uh, the appeal is that young women who are, and some men, um, burdened with student debt can graduate debt-free mm -hmm. by dating older successful people and getting an allowance every month, okay. which I think is just like, it's weird to imagine a generation sort of selling its daughters into borderline commercial sex work. Yeah, I mean, it's monstrous. And <laughs> the idea that you would institutionalize this? Well, with like a degree, it's like the University and then, and then you'd of yell at Phoenix people like, well, why, don't you, why, why don't you get a why don't you get a job um, bussing tables to pay off your student loans mm -hmm. when student tuition has gone, you know, above medical tuition, which is above regular tuition, mm -hmm. uh, reg regular inflation, I mean, sorry. Mm -hmm. Medical inflation is above regular inflation mm -hmm. and tuition inflation is above medical. Mm -hmm. it, it, the whole thing is mad, but the system couldn't be kept together. Right. And so that is an intergenerational transfusing. Yeah, yeah. I mean, look, I, one of the most, one of the biggest rackets in this country after management consulting is the idea that all people should go to college. I think Germany has it right. They send most of them to vocational programs. Yeah. The idea that you should even be paying, you know, $40,000 a semester in tuition to get a communications degree as a super senior for five years is preposterous. Nobody needs to be saddled. Huh? You're going to blow it for these generations. Yeah. Why? Because it's a scam, man. They turned the most amazing part of our, of our country into this wealth transfer scam. It's just, a, it's, it's funny, but it's painful. Yeah. I mean, it's, and it's horrible. I was thinking about, you know, the kind of the idea of uh you are you familiar with this concept stob the russian parody stob stob we can get into this later because it's a whole don't know it. it it's a i think that this is like to to really understand the trump era for example you yeah. have to view it through this particular lens well give it to me it's a it's a late soviet parody genre or style that involves an over identification so extreme that it's unclear whether you're uh endorsing authentically endorsing a position or perpetuating an elaborate troll okay so it's basically a post-ironic gesture if you look at like the golden age of uh liberal entertainment as you know uh, john stewart the daily show right uh, which was kind of characterized by this is a, a really long winded digression. I didn't mean to go here. Drink up. Let's yeah. Do it. Yeah. I'll keep going. Um, as characterized by, um, you know, this kind of snarky, implicitly moral, su morally superior, ironic posture, right? Um, that was, I think, supplanted eventually by this kind of stoop over identification, right? Uh, where it's unclear, for example, with people like me and Dasha, it's unclear what position we're actually endorsing, right? And Trump, for example, is the master of the strategy. And so he plays- So we do, we both acknowledge that Trump has some crazy genius to him. I think he's a total genius. All right, good. But I think that he's an artistic genius, not a political genius. Yeah, he's an artistic genius. I think that he's an artist. He's a Gemini, just like my mother. My mom hates Trump with like a fire because they're the same person down to the kind of miserable cunty expression they uh kind of emote when they're in a irritated mood it's really stunning. how is that kantian huh how is that kantian kantian kanti kanti am i oh okay <laughs> um but i'm very gullible uh which is why i'm not a troll but you take somebody like uh trump the guy is so over invested mm in performing his own incompetence that any parody of him by an outsider right. reads as cringy and overdetermined, which is why SNL has sucked for the last... I well, mean, but, but in part, you have to get something right before you can parody it, right? Yeah. And um, I don't know if you ever saw this video, I think it's called something like, in the, because of the music in the hall of the Trumpian king. Mm -hmm, 
No. Okay, so it's all of these liberal comedians from this golden era that you're talking about mm. in the most knowing and oppressive way possible saying, buddy, you're not going to win. Mm -hmm. Come on, we mm -hmm. all know it. Mm -hmm. And everyone's saying like, oh, please run. Mm -hmm. Oh, it'll be so entertaining. Like there's no concept that this is real. Yes, yeah. And, and yeah. every single one of those people who appeared on this, including John Oliver and Stephen Colbert, became unfunny to me in just about everything that they did after. They went so over the top. Yeah, momentarily, yeah. That they showed that they didn't understand. Like, you can't mock this stuff. And what a p betrayal, like on a Freudian level, what a collective betrayal of you know, parental authority that was. We really believed in these guys that they could be, that they could parse, like, sarcasm. They believed in them. They, yeah. Because, but this is this thing I've called the gated institutional narrative. Mm -hmm. It was protected against reality. I mean, I don't know whether, because of you, your- You have to publish like a coffee table book of, of your like uh, coinages and neologisms. I'd rather you make fun of the <laughs> Red Scare. Um, that could actually be fun. Yeah. Um, one of the things that I, and again, this is, this shows you how twisted my soul is, but as a pastime, I sometimes watch the last days of the Ceausescu's uh -huh. in Romania. Uh-huh. Because like right up until the you end. Go on, on a porn hub and Google the uh, the execution. Right. Uh, <laughs> under Slavic mill. Yeah. Um, it's, uh, it's very much like there's a rally and somehow the rally goes out of control. Mm -hmm. And order has to be restored and the cameras have to break the filming mm -hmm. of what's going on. Mm -hmm. And so right at the end, they've got this shrinking group of loyalists who are still terrified that these people are going to you know, regain power because that's the way it's always been, but everywhere the spell is broken. Mm -hmm. And I guess that's sort of what I saw is that this thing was just, it was an American version of um, propaganda that had been so believed that when it started not to be true, the organs just kept pumping out all of this encouragement that, you know, think Hillary is going to win. There's no question. Mm -hmm. She's inevitable. I mean, even now they're running, you know, Kamala's out. So they're really going whole hog with Buttigieg. But it's, yeah, there's a certain, there's a certain lag between the progressive and uh, Trumpian and between kind of like uh, traditional Democrats and conservatives and the Trump administration. And I think like Trump uh, uniquely among world leaders possibly in the history of the world has been able to do this thing. I mean, I wrote a whole essay about it. He was he was able to do what the um, Russian avant-garde and the, the, the socialist realists had been trying to do, these two kind of uh, uh, sequential propaganda, like, arms of the culture industry in the Soviet Union, which was uh, maintain, which is achieve a total syn synthesis of the material and the imaginable or the imaginative. What, you know. Sounds really good. Slow I mean, it down and give it to me. I mean, what, you know, it, it's kind of like the typical like Soviet avant-garde idea that we were creating a total synthesis of art and life, like a, a single kind of uh, art political project and trump alone has been able to do this though crucially under a, a very capitalist not communist regime he's been able to marry um what we can imagine like what we imagine and what is materially possible yeah it, he's been very ineffective in bringing in uh, an entire like there is no theory of Trump yeah. because almost no one either on his side or on the opposition side actually understands how much method he brings and it's cryptic. So it right. looks, you know, there's it's a lot little, of indirection. He understands indirection. He does, he's, he, but he's he got these formulas that I, I, I can't tell you how bizarre it is. I mean, you, you probably know my friend Sam Harris who was sitting here and we were having this argument, mm -hmm. uh, friendly, but an argument nonetheless. I'm gonna rub the seat for good luck. <laughs> a lot of weird stuff has yeah, happened yeah. in that chair. Um, 
Has, has Joe Rogan ever sat in this seat? Not yet. I have a crush on Joe Rogan. Really? I know he's married, but I think everyone. People, does. Yeah, everybody does. Yeah. yeah, I think that he really could be the guy who could run and win against Trump. He does not want me he to doesn't... talk about this. Okay. Because okay, you can it, edit it, it out. Brings, well, no, because he, he's not. In, he's got a great life. Yeah. And the fact that everybody loves him causes people to sort of do weird things in his presence. He just wants to be a regular guy. He's also. Yeah. You know, and I don't mind saying this behind average his, Joe. Yeah, he, yeah. That he is not. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, he he's running an incredible operation. Yeah. But whatever it is, there's a lot of method there. Because mm -hmm. if you think about how difficult it is to turn these shows out and to keep them fresh, it's almost mm -hmm. impossible. So there's a ton of genius going on in Joe's front. Um, he has not come yet, but he we agreed to do each other's podcasts. Okay. Um, what Sam did was mm -hmm. to say that he, Sam, thought that Trump was the evil Chauncey Gardner, that that was his theory of mine. Mm -hmm. And I thought that is insane. I mean, it's not that Sam and I tried to have it out. We can't see each other's point. Mm -hmm. and I'm not saying that Sam is wrong, but I see so much method to Trump's uh, trolling. And he doesn't. He thinks that this is all kind of like arbitrary. Well, I think what he does, you know, I, I, another thing I say is, is that Sam is more focused on honesty and I'm more focused on meta honesty. Okay. Trump is not an honest person, but in a weird way, he is meta honest. Right. So he's right when he says he's an honest, honest he, person. Well, because on some find, level he is. Yeah. Yeah. So, but what we care about is that, like, for example, Trump knows the, the liberal mind is automated. Mm -hmm. And as soon as you break through mm -hmm. one of its shibboleths, mm -hmm. it has an automated non-thinking reflexive mm -hmm. reaction. And he can map that and then he can say, okay, I'll do something that will cause the reflexive reaction, mm -hmm. but I will put something in place which is totally different so that when you have that reflexive reaction, you will be shown to be a non, an NPC. Mm -hmm. Well, what's the, am I, am I allowed to look at my phone? There was that hilarious tweet. Uh, I will stall for you. No, that's okay. I don't even have to, but the, I have to look at my phone every 10 minutes or else I die. Um, there's that tweet that he had today about Greta Thunberg and how she needs to get her like anger issues under control. Well, she, yeah, she, hilarious. It's so wrong, well, but it's so, okay. I mean, the man but, has like the Midas touch when it comes to Twitter. Well, but I'm let's talk about that. Game. Let's talk about that tweet. Yeah. So, um, so Greta is this, uh, self-described autistic girl who's yeah, mad as hell yeah. about climate and who is being, um, even if she has authenticity to her, there's an entirely inauthentic uh, complex Around. that has settled her on her, that wants to use her the way the World Wildlife Federation used mm -hmm. the panda bear mm -hmm. as charismatic megafauna. So mm -hmm. in some sense, Greta, the actual human, is also the charismatic megafauna of a propaganda campaign, which is lying in order to probably tell the truth. So right. you've got this real climate emergency. Yes. You should be able to do a truthful campaign, mm -hmm. but that can't work. So you have to do a lying campaign mm -hmm. and you use an actual human being as your mascot. Right. So it's like layers and layers of confusion. Right. And the idea of course, is that you can't attack an autistic child, particularly a female one. Yeah. And because she's angry. Mm -hmm. And so Trump's so Trump sees opportunity. Yes. And he's going to go at the layer where he's going to say, she has anger management issues. She should get it <laughs> under control, go to an old fashioned movie with friends. And then he uses chill Greta chill Yeah, where chill is both an admonition in terms of chill out, uh -huh. but also a reference to global cooling. Right. Yeah. And, all, you know, and also keep in mind all of this um, just days after on the heels of the Pamela Carlin remark about Baron Trump that prompted Melania to tweet in her little baby daddy voice. Do not talk to my minor son that way. You know, I love when I read everything in her like sexy baby voice. Yeah. And so okay so by the way i'm so jealous because i can't say anything like that yeah because you have the xx going yeah you can get away with murder yeah uh, the xx and like advanced uh what's it called like wet brain from my, my like years of being a russian alcoholic but it's you know okay so this woman who's a like a state witness for the the impeachment proceedings insult ostensibly insults trump's kid and that's not kosher but uh 
he can insult a 16 year old climate change activist. Because, well, but this is this, this whole thing. So if you look at how complex this, this troll is, he is appealing to all of the people who see the manipulation of the real Greta right. for this fake campaign, which in my opinion is actually crowding out the real campaign that should be there because climate is an issue, but it's misportrayed because it has to be done in a simplistic fashion. Yes, so yeah. you've got like millions of layers there and Trump is finding his support in the people who see through part of it. Yes. Okay. The other thing is, is that he does have this thing where he knows that because his own child has been brought in mm -hmm. as a combatant, that he should be allowed to do something like yeah. this. You and, should be able to use somebody else's child as a human shield. Well, particularly one that yeah. is being pushed forward by time right. as person of the year. Yes. So. Oh God, are we there yet? Uh, We're there. Okay. That happened, didn't it? Oh, I thought Lizzo was the person of the year. I thought it was Greta. Oh, I don't know. They should just mud wrestle and get it over with. Um, anyway, go ahead. Okay. So yeah. in any event, um, that was a perfect version of, uh -huh. this isn't Trump the child. This is Trump the master strategist. Right. It's a trap. Mm -hmm. Because the, the the liberal or left of center mind just says, whoa, Trump attacked an autistic girl. <laughs> yeah. And if that was the simplicity of it, they'd be right. Mm -hmm. And it's in no way, shape, or form the simplicity right, of it. Right, but he's he's really kind of a genius at doing that. And it's so sad that he, there is no avant-garde art. It's, I, I mean, I said this on my podcast, avant-garde art today is the sum of the Trump PR team's social media output and uh, coupled with the kind of unintentional comic fallout of woke ad campaigns. Well, for example, you use the word retarded. Yes. If I were to say, I, I'm really offended, I, I have a developmentally uh, challenged relative, mm -hmm. you might respond, oh, I don't think retarded people are retarded. Yeah. Right, and, and they wouldn't understand that it's a comment on an overloaded term. Right. Well, it's a it's a commentary, it's a critique, it's a mockery of of people who disingenuously oppose the use of the word. It's not actually a commentary or a mockery of actually but, disabled people. But you could see people. that there was a reason. I mean, as somebody who um, developmentally struggled in school, mm -hmm. I have a certain. Wait, are, oh, we're talking. I was like, are you talking about you or me? Me. It's like, you don't know me. You can't judge me. Anyway, go on. Well, as somebody who struggled in school, I'm I I have some sensitivity around right. Okay, like being you know having somebody say like if they see my handwriting, people yeah. say like, are, are you are you a, a an axe murderer? You yeah, know? it's like what's are, your handwriting? I'm it's, it doesn't look like anything. Okay, it looks like Jackson Pollock. It looks like prisoner scrolls. Yeah, yeah. I, lo I love that Trump's handwriting. By the way, is very bubbly and girlish. You can almost see him drawing very, a heart bef above the eye like oh, they definitely. did in high school. Yeah. And uh, it's very, very like angular and swoopy. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I can see how it started, mm -hmm. but then it became like the language police and it's completely out of control. Yeah, I mean, look, and I object to, to being, I resent being policed by people who were guilty of the same crimes, you know, just right. 18 months ago or whatever. Yeah. Um, I resent in general, not people, but how... Uh, the culture, the system, or whatever you want to call it, um, has become so callous, so transactional, um, so interested in meeting out kind of punitive justice, and so incapable of giving people uh, the benefit of the doubt. There's no largesse of spirit. Nobody believes that anything anybody does anything out of like humor or jouissance anymore. Well, because in many in many ways, it's become like a scavenger hunt where you have to collect. Do you have the head of a racist? Do you have the head of a misogynist? Do you have the head of a, yeah. an anti-Semite? And so, you you know, and then you get bingo if you, if you, if you call out all of these yeah, yeah. people. So partially it's a reward structure. I think one of the ways which it was called out, and I hate that term, but there you are, um, really well by Joe, is that he had a, um, he was, I watched him work up a routine over several nights mm -hmm. on, wrestling is gay and he starts mm -hmm. off with wrestling is really gay mm -hmm. and because gay is an epithet in mm -hmm. some cases 
people made the association, okay, wrestling is stupid. Mm -hmm. That's not what he said. He said, wrestling is gay. So they, f they, they take the bait. This mm -hmm. is very Trumpian, mm -hmm. but this is Joe doing it as a comic. Right, right. And he says, whoa, 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 whoa. You just completed that in your mind. Yeah. I yeah. didn't say what you think I said. And then, and then now you're now like you're in the pitcher plant or the Venus flytrap is uh -huh. closed. And he says, let's think about this. You got two guys in gold shorts with lace up booties rolling around. Rubbing each sweat. other's bodies together. Yeah. yeah. If this isn't gay, mm -hmm. what is? Mm -hmm. Well, when, when he starts doing it that way, you realize that you took the bait. You had, a, you had an automated reaction mm -hmm. as opposed to a thoughtful one. Mm -hmm. um, and that shows off the comic skill um, by laying the trap. I mean, you saw another one of these with Dave Chappelle where right. he says, I'm going to do an impression of the audience uh -huh. and the audience is insufferable. Uh -huh. or, no, he says, I'm going to do an impression. I'm going to ruin your life and I'm going to make it impossible for you to earn a living. And mm -hmm. like people thought it was Trump and he says, no, it's you. Mm -hmm. So the fourth wall is broken. The finger is pointed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, um, yeah. I mean, look, and that's on some level, I feel like I shouldn't, uh, be fully confessional because that'll take away some of the allure and the mystique but this is what I do with my Twitter I set things up in such a way that people always inevitably take the bait and it's not because I Those like people to, don't watch this program don't worry yeah that they don't yeah and um, this is true and the thing that, that that's so kind of um, it's eternally amusing and yet disheartening my my own my only goal you know now that i'm like a a glass of red deep is to get people to think and to draw their own conclusions and when but when they do think this is why you know democracy on some level isn't possible when they do um now we're getting into the asmr portion this now this sounds like my podcast we're like pouring okay. <laughs> I'm popping bottles, pouring wine. I'm going to light up in this studio. Just kidding. Um, but when people do uh, kind of get their little engines a turning, they always somehow, or the people that I'm used to dealing with at any rate, always somehow uh, draw the worst possible, least mutually flattering conclusion that speaks volumes about where the culture at large is at. But when you look at yourself metacognitively, mm -hmm. like I have this thing that I call the robot, which is the mm -hmm. thing that I, I observe making these automated decisions. And then I have another thing I call the metacognitive perch where I watch my robotic self and I'm just mm -hmm. horrified right. by what decisions it makes, how it conducts itself. Yeah. I see you as having this distance as an intrinsic part of your personality. And the person I'm talking to is really sitting on the metacognitive perch. Yeah, I mean, but this is the the, the kind of um, uh, blessing and burden of being a dysfunctional, <laughs> traumatized Russian person. It sucks being Russian. You, what are you, you see, talking about? no, you see the chessboard. Yeah, which is a it, it's more of a burden than it is a blessing because you it makes life very difficult to live. I Say more. I, you know, I sympathize with people like Brad Easton Ellis and Michelle Welbeck, who are my two favorite novelists. People will laugh uh, because I'm not reading like Flaubert or Balzac, but um, because they have their they have this metacognitive perch. Their their books are about meta commentary. It, it's, it's social commentary disguised as fiction, which to me is kind of the most elite form of writing. Well, Brett, you know, so Brett sat in your chair and we talked about this issue that I had accused him of privatizing our mutual childhood since we mm -hmm. came from the same milieu. Okay. And he talked about the importance of the narrator, I guess clay in less than zero mm -hmm. who's detached from the horrors of what he's seeing. He's weirdly drawn. Yes. Just the way we are to look at an auto accident, but he's also just, clinically kind of detailing well this is what happened mm -hmm. and you know somehow i brought up joan didion mm -hmm. in that session and he confessed that this was his favorite author mm -hmm. and i think about her detachment where she was watching the sort of 60s debauchery and he was watching the 70s debauchery oh, right and just the sense of 
having a traditional sensibility viewing the destruction of traditional like you can see that this is a very long unraveling of the fabric of society yeah and that's i mean that's my beef with all of these critiques of welbeck right um the primary one being that he's kind of a nihilist and, and a misogynist um and in my mind especially with this new book serotonin which i don't know if you've read but if you haven't you should read it um it's you know a, a giant eulogy for the decline of Western civilization and the moral failure of liberal consensus. Um, uh, but the main question, the kind of principal organizing theme of his work, in my mind, has always been, is love possible under advanced capitalism? What kind of nihilist is it that concerns himself with a question as meaningful and significant as the possibility the question of love? Why do you think that comes up? What? what in order for that book to be interesting that question has to be interesting right what makes that question interesting uh, whether love is possible under advanced capitalism i well, if, if i said is uh is uh, transportation by automobile uh possible under advanced capitalism it right. wouldn't be an interesting question right so why is it even a question is love possible because i think you know a vast uh, kind of significant uh majority of people at least people who are kind of in kind of inoculated in into some sort of intellectual society or professional society professional class believe that it's not or suspect that it's not well but what is it and like, i for, for I, example if i were to ask you the let's go ahead no i suspect that um they actually want it to be true that love is not possible under advanced capitalism because then that offloads their own uh, say in the matter, their own responsibility uh, to the system or whatever. If I asked, are novels possible to read? Like, are great novels possible to read in the age of Twitter? Um, sure. Yeah, they're possible to read. I don't know that they're possible to write. Or to feel, or to not feel, even. Yeah. I'm not positive that they are. Many yeah. of us have noticed a bizarre inability to plunge into a book. We we think of ourselves as book people, right? But we don't. We feel that our brains have been rewired, much the way porn has changed the way in which um, we find our lovers. I think that Twitter has changed the way we find our novels, right? On some level, yeah. I mean, there's no. There's no longer a need, or uh, I don't know about a desire, but there's no longer kind of a necessity for a long for for a work of art that has a long form expository narrative structure. I totally disagree. You think that? I mean, I think most people don't sense that. Or, or, Television got so weirdly good, at it nobody was expecting that. Right. But TV came out of nowhere. Modern TV has longer narrative arcs than any movie. Yes, because the movie industry was completely eroded, right? Well, because The Sopranos and Mad Men and all that figured out something we didn't understand. Yeah, but I think TV is also like watching is meaningfully different from reading. Well, I guess what I'm trying to say is, is that if you think about this from an evolutionary perspective, mm -hmm. there's kind of an adaptive landscape for various forms of mimetic dissem dissemination of story narrative information. Mm -hmm. And some of them have gotten terrible. But like if you, if you looked at 1970s television, mm -hmm. I went back to look at uh, The Love Boat from my right. youth. It's unwatchable. Right. And, I can imagine, yeah. But Game of Thrones is weirdly, strangely compelling. Yes, it is, yeah. And the way in which movies, like there was just this transfer of wealth from cinema into the idiot box. Uh -huh. And that's fascinating because everything else tells us, or long form podcasting is a very strange parallel structure. Where are attention spans getting really long? They're getting long somewhere. Somewhere, yeah, it's being transferred. I mean, you know, I had this thought earlier today in my hungover state where it dawned on me 
I had a little bit of um kind of like a feminine imposter syndrome moment and I was like this is ridiculous that I'm like going on this guy's podcast I'm some hostess from Bushwick you know and then it's I thought it's mine yeah and I was like you know it's retarded it's gay whatever it's all this kind of bevy of ridiculous words it's, it's like completely by like, the way to all the advertisers who just left the program it's been a great run yeah, Thank yeah, you. yeah um but uh then I think about it and I uh see that with podcasting there is the possibility of a revival of the era of the public intellectual which is something that people crave also like the, the new as undignified as it sounds the new class of like podcasting personas are possibly will possibly be able to revive something like that uh image or social role which is important i think well i think you could also look at this a little bit like William Tell mm -hmm. um, or, you know, Philip Petit uh, walking the tightrope between the twin towers. Part of what makes long form podcasting exciting is the idea that we could screw up at any moment mm -hmm. and destroy our names and reputations. Mm -hmm. And I think that that should I do it for you now? I can. We well, started. I'm yeah. I'm a little wind up now. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, that well, be, but you see, you're a vice signaler. Uh huh. You said this to me during our power lunch. You have to re. I I say this to the audience with no hint of sarcasm. I really like when men mansplain things to me. I think that it's fun and cool. So vice signaling. Um, I think more people are talking about it now. But I originally started talking about it because it came out of the theory for me of contract bridge mm -hmm. where you have to say what it is you're going to do and then you're judged by whether or not you accomplish that which you said you were going to do okay so what i view modern society as being is a game in which you're fitted with a white suit that you did not ask for uh -huh. and then the key question is do you keep it clean or uh -huh. does it become soiled right okay well, my first belief is you're crazy to accept a white suit because that's not going to work out well. Right. So I picked Dan Bilzerian as my uh -huh. example. Right. And your fellow Armenian. Another fellow Armenian, yeah. So his thing is guns, drugs, uh -huh. and automatic weapons. Uh -huh. And that's don't, don't and, forget and the, money. Don't forget the hose. Sorry, gun, sorry guns. <laughs> it's the wine. Yeah. Girls. Yeah. Guns. Yeah. And drugs and money. Those okay. those are his four big things. Yeah. You can't um embarrass him by saying, "Hey, you just took a bunch of chicks out into the desert and gave them automatic weapons after you coked them up." Yeah. Or gave them weed because like, "Yes, that's my business model." Uh-huh. And as a result, there's no industry trying to take down Dan Bilzerian. Right. I mean, I mean, I think I said this to you. I don't remember because I was wind up then too. Um, I said, you know, it's the same thing with somebody like Howard Stern or Donald Trump. They never promised to respect women, so they can't get taken down for not respecting women. Meanwhile, all these guys who are playing like the virtue game uh, get at least they at least get their reputations true, tarnished. Actually, In the two cases that you talked about. Howard Stern's original uh, gambit was that he wanted to be lashed to the mast mm -hmm. and be surrounded by uh, TNA and, mm -hmm. and just as much cleavage as, as, as was possible. And then he would do nothing. Mm -hmm. And so that was his, that was his game was that he was Ulysses. And so it was a promise uh -huh. and he was married throughout. And then his wife would call up while he was surrounded by temptation. Yeah. In the case of Bilzerian, he's got a different promise. The promise is, I will not lie to you and you will not lie to me. I'm not telling you that you have to be monogamous with me. I'm not telling you any one of a number of things. I will be straight with you. You will be straight with me. And if we can't have honesty, then you have to leave. Okay. So those are incredibly weird gambits. Uh -huh. You have to give both of these men their due. It's, they're very unusual. Right. Right. Or socially engineering something. Well, my favorite Dan Bilzerian um, post on Instagram mm -hmm. is he's there, I think, with no shirt because he, he's also uh, kind of a confection. He serves right. himself up as a, he self objectifies. A snack, yeah. yeah. And um, he's reaching out to this woman who's more clothed than he is uh -huh. to come up a step somewhere in Greece. Yeah. And the caption is, 
come with me, I'll ruin your life, but you'll have fun. Right. And like, I really think that's his proposition. Yeah, I, I really have to hand it to Armenian men because they alone among men are, are just as vain as women. Are they? Yeah, they really like to objectify themselves. Well, but you see, in my opinion, women are really the males of the human species because as the adorned, <laughs> as the adorned gender... No, yeah. no, no. Take As it seriously. Gender, you you are now echoing a, a thesis proposed by this woman, Andrea Long True, who's like a, a transgender writer, um, who was also echoing Valerie Solanas, um, who made who has the same hypothesis. That's interesting to hear Eric Wine. You say Weinstein. 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 Yeah. I think the power move, the yeah. power move, Eric, if yeah. I may say so, is to have Harvey on, in this chair. No. No, you can't. No, well, no. I mean, there are there are people who've been canceled mm -hmm. who I'm interested in. Right. And there are people who have been canceled that I'm perfectly happy that they are that canceled. They, yeah. And this is part of the, part of my problem, which is that well, I mean, this is a difference between us. Too, yeah. Which is the way I view it mm -hmm. is is that you have accepted the game but you're going to behave really badly within it. Right. I haven't accepted the game. Yeah. I've rejected the game. Okay. And I understand the motivations for how this woke stuff got started. Uh -huh. And I'm sympathetic with them to a point. And I'm completely unsympathetic with how non self reflective and shallow and mean spirited mm -hmm. it is while pretending that it cares. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to carry that tension. So you and I are on slightly different missions. Yeah, yeah. You're going to carry the tension of I'm 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 okay being earnest. Like my yeah, answer it, my answer to your Nietzsche point right is around you. So for example, you know, this is a three-dimensional projection of a four-dimensional convex polytope. Okay. And I find it transcendent. Uh -huh. So I'm holding up what is this 120 cell uh, which is the name of the convex polytope, which is a generalization of the dodecahedron to four dimensional mm -hmm. space. Mm -hmm. um, and you have one over there that's yes, I do. the 24 cell, it's a and which is the value. unique one that doesn't correspond to one of the platonic solids. Right. I look at that one by you uh -huh. and I just marvel at it. And I think about it the way people think about like seraphim. Yeah. It's like, I don't have religion in my life at the same level that my ancestors did. Right. But you have some, but I have, I have the the wonder of mathematics and physics and biology uh -huh. that that plugs the same religion shaped hole in my soul. Yeah, and so that's how I've solved the Nietzsche problem. That's why I remain earnest, much to the chagrin of some of my listeners. I know, but I think I actually think that we're fundamentally at the end of the day on the same page about this. I think we're very close to being, yeah. and I think this is one of the reasons why I covertly brought up your father uh -huh. because this. I I, I think that the Jewish and the Soviet and the Armenian, um, you know, all of these things, uh, these are very old traditions that feel very deeply and they, they're, we're naked about caring. Right. And I guess we're actually, we're back to where we started. It's yeah. improv baby. But, um, the, there's this idea, I think the kind of in America, there's this very reductive idea of like white people, right? White people. There's, uh, there are all these different non-white ethnicities and cultures, but white people are a singular block. Through and, the magic of this country only. Right. But I've, uh, but you know, I mean, I don't know if you have the similar kind of experience. I've always felt, for example, very alienated from uh, Nordic non-Jewish whites, right? Or just to give you an example. Right. I, I don't, you know, have any beef with them, but those people are not my people on some You'd level. You'd think that. And then one of my largest constituencies um, abroad are Sweden and Norway. Your demos. Yeah. That makes sense because they're, they're also actually very earnest people. And they're also weirdly having their idealism that has worked very well and is in fact yes. trotted out by the left abused against them so mm -hmm. that they are now starting to feel like WTF. Mm -hmm. Why can't we talk about some of the tensions that we're experiencing? Like there right. is something that it means to be Swedish or Norwegian mm -hmm. or Icelandic. Right. And to be told, well, this, your identity is just that you're European. And even that is yeah. only 
like this whole question about software nationalism versus hardware nationalism. You have lots of people in the UK, for example, from South Asia, who by going through the Oxbridge system sound entirely like the British upper crust. Exactly, yeah. And and, and further, sometimes they come from the, the high castes that the British favored working with mm -hmm. in India or Pakistan. Now, the idea that Enlightenment ideas or Anglo-Saxon ideas can run on any hardware, it's like boot camp where you've got an Apple machine that's running Windows, mm -hmm. you know? Uh, I don't really care too much about the hardware. I care a great deal about the software. Mm -hmm. And the idea that everybody of European descent or who are interested in European cultures should apologize, I'm having none of this. I mean, yeah. there's so much music and science and architecture and you know the, all the terrible things that happened too. I will not have that watered down. That's an authentic experience. But the thing that bothers me about it is, and this is another one of my riffs, um, you have this problem with vanilla, mm -hmm. where vanilla has two meanings. Mm -hmm. One is boring, flavorless, okay, bland. And the other is like the most flavorful of spices okay, and flavorings and tastes. Yeah. And somehow they're both vanilla. Well, white is the same thing. White is the most bland, boring. It's like a canvas that has been gessoed, but not painted upon. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, if you look at European culture, is there anything richer and spicier and more intricate and interesting? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And somehow our minds are just bananas over these two descriptions. Yeah, I mean, it's, but it's, it's always, it's very offensively uh, reductive on a way that personally strikes me because the kind of, the only thing uh, uh, keeping me from being, becoming like a typical Welbeckian uh, protagonist or one of these like horrible millennial girl bosses who's fundamentally empty inside is a great deal of kind of like honor and respect that I feel for my ancestors and the cultural kind of the amniotic fluid that we all came out of. Well, but it's worse. I mean, you're in a very funny position. You are culturally like your, your podcast is called Red Scare. Yeah. And you are culturally very Russian, Soviet, Jewish, Armenian. Mm -hmm. But if you really look at it, you can see that it's fading. Yeah. And you're not going to have grandchildren that relate to you. Yeah, and that's, uh, that's really a terrifying thing. And it's actually a terrifying thing on two levels because, right, A, you're not going to have, grandchildren who relate to you on like a practicable level um but b to even acknowledge that you want grandchildren uh to relate to you kind of flies in the face of this very leftist doxy that um a culture is relevant and it makes me think of like you know the idea of um narcissism that somebody like lash was so kind of brilliant at identifying diagnosing uh, and at the time he was writing in the 60s and 70s, uh, he billed it as kind of the generational pathology of our time, the, the kind of liberated persona. Uh, but even at that time, narcissism was still at the very least a system of positive affinities. So you identified through affinity, right? Uh, originally maybe you identified with your ethnicity or your religion and then later you came to identify with your lifestyle markers you know you did yoga or uh, composting or recycling or whatever and gradually over time that's yielded to kind of a nar negative narcissism where people at large uh, identify with their oppression and their adversity but Russians identify with their oppression and their adversity in a very strong way that doesn't look anything like what we're doing in the U.S. Okay, see, I've never heard this one before. Oh, really? Yeah. Uh, I just thought we were kind of miserable, melancholic people. I think there's a general kind of, you know, Anna Pavlova, the great Russian ballerina, said that the Russian soul is marked by melancholy. Yeah. Yeah. I think that it's, well, you know, the... the um, it's very interesting. I, uh, when I had Gary Kasparov on the program, mm -hmm. 
he, <laughs> there were some very odd moments. Mm -hmm. So I, I tried to do a, a an intro in Russian where I said that he was unclear that he was, if he was Gary Kasparov or Gary Weinstein, because that was right. his first name. Right. And he immediately just didn't bite on it. Yeah. I'm jealous but, that you didn't do the Russian language intro for me. Really? My chopped liver. Just kidding. No, go on. Okay. Well, I, I felt that uh, in order, I, well, I mean, we actually didn't even talk about it. Almost no one reacted to it. Yeah, yeah. One of my hopes was for the program was to start personalizing it to all of the cultures that I care the most about. Mm -hmm. And so I did this thing about um, mm -hmm. because in the Moscow subways and the subways of other cities, there's this thing which says, you know, warning doors are closing. The, the next stop is yeah. you know, yeah. like that, yeah. that thing. I always thought it'd be cool that the portal was like the Moscow doors uh -huh. uh, opening and closing. And he just didn't react at all to it. Mm -hmm. The one weird thing where there was like a shiver of recognition mm -hmm. was I talked about um, the Russian satirical magazine, Crocodile, mm -hmm. and how dissent and irreverence existed within the Soviet Union, but in this very specified way so that there was a valve to let things to let off steam mm -hmm. and it wasn't the american picture where nobody could say anything at any time because mm -hmm. that would never work mm -hmm. the russian system was much more sophisticated right and that was the one moment at which he sort of gave me a little bit of a nod like wow you really know your stuff and the thing is it's very hard for an american to connect to the broad slavic soul yeah and for us to connect to the broad american soul um I think I said this to you, you know, the kind of idea that Russians are basically optimists masquerading as cynics and Americans are cynics masquerading as optimists. I mean, that's like broadly on some level, like stereotypically true. Um, and I also remember saying that uh, Russians, unlike Americans, you know, if you have a classroom of American kids and you ask them like who's done X or who is Y, the hands shoot up because uh, in America, it's much, much less dangerous historically to identify yourself. And Russians are in the business of indirection, misdirection, non-identification, because it, it was at some point a political problem that had a kind of material real world consequences, but has been handed down to successive generations as a behavioral quirk that's actually really problematic if you're trying to have like a you know a romantic relationship with like an american man for example but uh yeah we're very weird damaged people i mean i said this i tweeted about this um that conversation with kasparov was really weird because it was like an insight into all of my communication impasses with american people say more about that well in to the degree that i don't like to disclose or identify myself right i like to misdirect by saying a great deal of stuff that seems kind of superficially very confessional and personal but actually nobody knows anything about me people know a lot more about you than you think they know about yeah you. but only through kind of um non-verbal or, or subconscious uh means I think that's right. Yeah, not through anything th th that exists on the verbal register. The well, but I think I've... that, you, you know, I don't know how many podcasts you've done like this. Probably none. Probably none. Yeah. Um, and I do think that you're going to find that your mystique uh, coexists with your revelation. They're not as rivalrous as you might imagine. Yeah, that's, a, that's possibly a good point. But I, I think like... Uh, but what did you hear in the cast? Like, so you, so you listened to that podcast. Yeah. Um, well, we, we famously tried to talk over each other. He's very forceful. Right. I would like to think that I've been far less forceful with you than I was with him. Yeah, but I'm also easier to get along with. Well, I view you as potentially more dangerous. Yeah, but that's only because I'm a woman. It, Kasparov and I have the same uh, ethnic breakdown, basically, which in Russia is called Grimuche Smis. Grimuche Smis. Like explosive mixture. Okay. So it's like... Um, a binary weapon that when combined... It's like dynamite. Much, yeah. The kind of like uh, when Armenians and Jews join forces right. in a single person, it's basically an incredibly difficult, combative 
categorical personality and i think that's probably what he ha he is i mean i don't know a ton about him but i'm kind of obviously interested because he's cheated of his meaning because there's something about the fact that putin to him is this unrecognized master menace uh -huh. and that we're running a clown show well, the fate of the world spins out of control. He has very much of a cold, I mean, I have much more of a cold war uh, overlay in my mind than most of my contemporaries and certainly than my millennial audience. I can't believe that we have nuclear weapons that they haven't been used in a long time and that we imagine that this will go on forever. And that they're laying kind of dormant for now. Um, I mean, but this brings me back to the whole concept of Stoab, which dovetails very nicely with the idea of hyper-normalization, right? Which um, the documentarian Adam Curtis took the right. title for his famous documentary from this term, which was coined by this guy, Alexei Yurchuk, um, Yurchuk um, who's a, an anthropology professor uh, who did a, a lot of kind of uh, research uh, on Stoab with this guy, Dominic Boyer, a, a fellow anthropologist. Uh, and I guess the basic principle of hypernormalization, as I understand it in my feeble female brain, is that, you know, there was kind of an elite guild of experts, uh, technologists, financiers, uh, uh, politicians, who kind of, if not conspired, then agreed to... Uh, invent kind of a fake world atop the real world that we inhabit because the real world had grown so complicated that it was that they had to model it into you know in simplified terms it's almost like fassbender's world on a wire where you're living in like a successive a nesting doll of like successive simulation matryoshka yeah matryoshka yeah um and uh, I forgot what we were going, where we were going with this, but, um, but we we now live in this like kind of like hyper trophied, hyper real reality, where you know you said to me it's like very few people can see that they're part of the simulation. I don't know if I actually agree with that, because I I like to think that people are a lot smarter than we give them credit for. Well. See, I don't think it comes down to smart. I think it comes down to our self-blinding. Yeah. And so one illusion. of the reasons I was asking you what you had heard in the Gary uh, Kasparov podcast was I wasn't sure what happened during it. I think that he, I mean, I don't know if you want me to psychoanalyze. This is like a very meta podcasting. Um, We've gone pretty meta. Yeah, I hurt. think that he was deflecting your earnest attempts at mutual identification, which is like the basis of all kind of bonds, right? I'm so excited, right, when I meet um, kind of a fellow traveler self. in any capacity. Self. Self in the yeah, other. and I told you this during our lunch. I was like, oh my God, we're like, you know, relatives, right? There's something very familiar. I feel like I've known you for yeah. forever and I've met you twice. Yeah, and there's something very familiar in meeting other people from a kind of a similar cultural background. Um, and I tend to collect them. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if that's racist, let me know. It's very racist. But, <laughs> but um, so I think the Russian tendency, which I've tried to, for example, uh, minimize, mitigate in myself to adapt better to American society is to deflect any such attempts and to uh, kind of not, to not give anybody an inch, to not let anybody get to know you and to stay kind of distant. Are you open to being the unreliable narrator? Uh, I'm not sure what that question means. Well, sometimes like, I forget, if, maybe if it's Edgar Allan Poe's telltale heart where you're telling a story about the self and the story reveals something to the audience. Maybe Captain Queeg in the Kane Mutiny would be a better example. Mm -hmm. He's talking about the strawberries and the men and mm -hmm. like really he's discussing his own paranoia in a way that's leaking out into the testimony he's right. giving. So what I see with you is that you are Russian or post-Soviet enough. Yeah but that you're very worried that it's not really a sustaining quality in this homogenizing sea. Like your mother, you can see, there's no way she can get away from it. I, I have never met the woman, but I can feel her, her presence as being intrinsically Soviet. And your podcast is called Red Scare, 
But first of all, that's a uh, an invocation of like the 1950s or earlier. Yeah, and menstruation. And menstruation and, yeah. and the thong and, and there's a tramp stamp. And, mm -hmm. you know, there's this whole aspect of um, you're worried that you can't actually keep it together. You can't hold the information back. You can't keep the identification with Eastern Europe because it's starting to fray. Yeah, on some level, but I, uh, also on another level, I feel kind of like a complete dinosaur. I'm relatively young, I'm youngish, but I feel uh, like uh, that, sometimes I feel kind of insane, right? Because I'm the only one who has, in my you know circle, for example, has kind of an, at an attachment to, some, to certain religious or ethnic cultures. I took cult an Ivy League admission at the University of Pennsylvania. And when everyone else went into investment banking or law or medicine, I went to math grad school mm -hmm. like your father because mm -hmm. there was something ancient about- And respectable about it? Well, but in the, it's respectable in the sense of like yichus, mm -hmm. like a Jewish concept. Mm -hmm. It was a very Jewish and self-destructive thing to do. Yeah to take this fantastic opportunity and say, okay, I'm gonna to try to achieve something for all eternity that seven people are really gonna deeply understand, yeah. something like that. And there's an aspect to this, which is, this is what animates Star Wars. Mm -hmm. The idea that Obi-Wan Kenobi and Yoda m mysteriously survive. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm not a fan of the Orig the Star Wars pictures that are supposed to come chronologically early. Right. But there is one scene, which is precious to me, where the Emperor says, execute order 66. And all mm -hmm. the Jedi are killed except two, mm -hmm. one of which lives by accident. Mm -hmm. That's Obi-Wan Kenobi. And Yoda intuits, ah, oh, shit. You know, this is the genocide and I'm going to be all that's left. Mm -hmm. So you are that thing that carries the seat. Yeah. That's a huge responsibility. That's why you have a podcast. But it's also the case that you're corroding in this extremely um, alkaline environment. Mm -hmm. That's like really beautiful and poetic and and also <laughs> a, horrib a horrifying reality to ponder. But it, yeah, it's true. Well, first of all, it's a gift to a Russian. If I gave you a horrifying, tragic yeah, mission. Yeah, we'll, we'll eat it right up. Yeah. yeah. But look, I no, remember... Camille Paglia, I think I'm supposed to say Paglia, really kind of re um, changed my thinking on on the Star Wars franchise, which I've always thought to be kind of like the nail in the coffin of the golden age of American cinema. Uh, I'll say more. I really want to hear this. Uh, the, you know, it, it was kind of like uh, it, it really opened the door. It paved the way for these mega franchises, the the Marvelization, the Disneyfication of film. Um, and her feeling about it was that it was a kind of epic eternal legend saga story that was uh, fulfilled or produced by means of the most cutting edge technology and that this is where art resides now in kind of the technological capacity of the Hollywood industry. Well, because transcendence is difficult to manufacture. And when you first see what a technology can do, the matrix would be an excellent uh, other example to, mm -hmm. to, to discuss. Uh, in that case, and I'm very partial to giving this example, there were multiple innovations. There was the wire work, there was bullet time with using still and moving uh, camera images and, and interplaying between them, and then there was CGI. Mm -hmm. And so the mind was never sure what it was seeing. Right. And so you you devote extra cognitive resources to the legend and, and archetype that's being explored when you're opened by transcendence. And that's mm -hmm. why we litter the set, for example, with Klein bottles often, because you know to have, to have a glassware from the fourth dimension that d defies the laws of inside and out mm -hmm. uh, opens people up to, well, what, what are these people are gonna be discussing? Is this a way out? Because I think everybody wants escape. Yes. And I think that if you go back to our Jewish tradition, the entire concept of like what is the what is the epic that we tell every year is our Star Wars? It's the Passover epic of mm -hmm. the Jews escaping. Mm -hmm. Now is the time 
when we understand why we tell that story because we need to get out of here. Yeah, I I think the kind of a uh, flattering uplifting version is escape. I think the cynical not so flattering version is offloading your responsibility in the way that somebody like Eric Fromm described foisting the responsibility for your life onto another. Yeah. Can I ask you sort of a final set of questions yeah. before I invite you back to the podcast yeah. when you're next in LA? Yeah. Because I hope you'll move here. I want to move here. Um, it's so horrible. It's I'm so meant horrible. to be an Armenian juice slut who hangs out at the Glendale Galleria. I'm not a New York girl. Anyway, go I'm ahead. I'm going to pass on yeah. that one. Yeah. Um, where are we in gender space? I have the feeling that men and women of heterosexual mindset needed to put their own mask on before helping everybody who was trying something different. Mm -hmm. I like that. That's like the plane and out the yeah. oxygen mask. Yeah. That's very Yeah. Cute. And that at the moment we're trying to like solve 12 million things that have all been lumped under trans. Mm -hmm. And I, I always give the analogy that strokes occur from excessive clotting and thinning. Mm -hmm. So you can't say something about strokes in general. Mm -hmm because you don't know which type of stroke. So we don't know which type of trans, mm -hmm. but if you just say, look, okay, we've got all these things about polyamory and bisexuality, homosexuality, non, non-binary relations, et cetera. Very complicated. Let's assume we have the best of intentions to everybody as a soul. Mm -hmm. We are now neglecting male, female, heterosexual, procreative relationships. Right. It's like an afterthought we got to do something where our concerns for all of these other variations don't obliterate the major workhorse of societal perpetuation. Okay. What are your thoughts? Well, what's the question? The thoughts are, the question is, are we getting dragged into a world in which we can't focus on the fact that the major workhorse of perpetuation needs its own care. Like for example, if you and I both opt in to heterosexual, heteronormative, yeah. cisgendered, et cetera, uh, ideas, we can't really continue to focus on our subset of people mm -hmm. because immediately the point is, well, you just excluded 12,000 12, other categories. Yeah. I see you as trying to- Just excluded 0.01 of the, yeah. Well, but I see what you're I see what you're you're trying to do in some sense. Yeah. Is reestablishing feminine mystique. Is that a fair comment? Yeah, absolutely. What do you see the role of mystique being in heterosexuality? The role of mystique, that's a good question. You see, I'm so I'm so kind of instinctive and non intellectual on some level that I don't even think about this. Um I think the uh, the app I, I would answer it in the negative way. I think the the absence of mystique kills libidinal energy absolutely you can't be taken seriously as but a woman example, if you disclose everything about yourself if you publish naked photos of yourself at all times i mean that's that's a statement of fact not a value but we we used to for example teach women to send mixed messages right and we used to teach men and women to play games mm-hmm and now increasingly there's a sort of Dr. Ruthification of male female relations, mm -hmm. which is like people should learn how to communicate, be direct, say everything that you want. Mm -hmm. Safe sex, affirmative consent, um, all these things that- Has anyone ever achieved enthusiastic consent? Right, I know, who like who are these people? Like you pull out an iPad when you, like, can I touch your breast? What's the, it's a it's I a want really you weird... so much, we should call our lawyers immediately. Yeah, yeah, and sign an NDA. An NDA. It's like um, every time the Buddha judge has sex with his husband, he signs an NDA. Um, but it's maddening because the whole allure of sex is precisely the unsafe the unconsec the unconsensual i'm not talking obviously about rape or coercion but women like mixed messages they like giving them they like receiving them it, because it's correct that they on some level don't know what they want and not because they're stupid or weak but because it's an evolving communicative process that unfolds do you know me well enough to order for me yeah, right. 
like maybe I would do a slightly better job of choosing my dish, mm -hmm. but if you do 90% as good as I would have got done ordering my dish and you can show me that you actually grasp me. Yeah, not only do you uh, get to enjoy the benefit of having a dish that you wanted, but you get to enjoy kind of the meta benefit of knowing that your partner knows you. I got in trouble for a tweet where I said that I like when my boyfriends or, or order food for me. That's so hot. I know, it's so hot. Why would any woman not want that? Well, I think because I can answer that from the guy's perspective. We've all thought we knew somebody well enough and we ordered just exactly the wrong thing, which right. shows that we have no concept of, yeah. we think we're on top of it, we, we're just not. Yeah, okay, so, cool. so there's no, some baked a, in disappointment, that the potential Well, remember the Aziz Ansari thing where like he didn't understand which wine she wanted and that was cause for humiliating yeah, him. For the her world. to write a, yeah, me too, so, medium, it was in a Times expose. Right, babe. That was babe. Dot net. Oh, babe .net. Yeah. oh God. But the um, the the key point would be that in order to handle certain edge cases, we deranged the general case. Mm -hmm. You know, like the world's most predatory men have to be kept away from the world's least agentic females. Mm -hmm. So, it, in order to handle that case, we gave nuclear weapons. I think Caitlin. Flanagan had a beautiful I observation. Love Flanagan, yeah. I can't get over her. Yeah, she's great. She's great. <laughs> the one that got away anyway. <laughs> anyway, she uh she said something to me to the effect of uh what's new is that all sexuality proceeds on exclusively female terms. Right. The idea being that men have to be completely non-agentic. Uh-huh. Because whatever the woman says happened or should happen. Yes is the law of the land. And this is precisely what women don't want. It's almost like a prisoner's dilemma type situation where you end up with the the most suboptimal outcome. Well, if you guard against the thing that you fear the most, you'll never get the thing that you want the most. Right, yeah, and it's it, it's a really kind of like bleak thing because no women, no heteronormative women want a man who lacks agency i mean you said this to me women want they don't want a guy who's an asshole they want somebody who's credible and the, the easiest shortest way to display credibility that is by yeah well this being is, an asshole yeah, this is a reference to a conversation we were having in which i i claim that many men learn a terrible lesson which is women want you to be an asshole mm -hmm. and the real lesson is women do not want to be told how beautiful and brilliant and this and that they are without some of that energy being spent on credibility. Yeah, if without because, some of it accruing into reliable, dependable material action. Well, but sometimes you have to say, you look very nice, it's not my favorite dress. Yeah. But, and that sounds a little non-positive, but it goes a long way to saying, okay, I'm actually getting real feedback. Are you describing the, the art of neg? You have to neg a little. No, I'm saying that that happens naturally. Mm -hmm. Negging is where you actually create like a, kind of a, a hole in the person's soul. Yeah, yeah. No, it's exactly not negging. Yeah. This is the thing. I mean, it's a beautiful example. It's a miscommunication. Mm. In the process of giving somebody, you can give somebody very positive, constructive feedback. And the slightest whisper of that wasn't exactly my favorite thing will be heard as a shout. Mm -hmm. Because that's how we human beings process criticism. Mm -hmm. And so... You have to spend some, people would much rather that you spend some of your time building credibility so that whatever you do say that's positive is actually a credible indicator of something. Because, mm -hmm. you know, traditionally, the key question is, is very often what women are asking is, is there something you find in me that is so rare that it would outweigh all other temptations? Mm -hmm. And can you please tell me a story in which that's true? Mm -hmm. The answer is no, ladies. The answer is no. no Run think... for the hills. I'm kidding. I'm just yeah. being a sarcastic little bitch. But um, well, don't do that, man. Why not? I don't know. I mean, if it's your shtick, but I do think that there's some aspect to this where we have to struggle with this. For like, you're an older millennial. Yeah, I'm an elder millennial. You're an elder millennial. Yeah, the guys the in the studio are like going to get snacks. They're so tired. They're like, enough of this. Well, no, I'm an elder millennial. Yeah. Go on. Um, I do think that in part, you know, you probably knew more life before the apps. Yeah. That's well, going to be a big 
transitional issue. Well, it's going to be a huge issue. I don't, I mean, I don't know what's going to happen to the next generation after me. I'm kind of afraid for them. I mourn for them because they have no, I mean, all social relations. It's like, you know, going back to those kind of uh, uh, empathy templates that I was talking about. Yeah. Uh, all social relations and, you know, on some level, particularly uh, sexual relations have become very Aspergian they've become autistic. People can't read nuance and they are completely incapable then of the art of seduction. And so everything operates according to like templates and consent forms. Phone trees. Yeah. And it, yeah. And, and it's terrifying because I think like what, it's not just women who desire credibility. What each sex desires from the other is credibility manifested in different ways you know like i made this joke i started seeing a shrink recently you went there i went there because i guess my my jewish side uh, finally uh, overwhelmed my russian side that's like profoundly hostile and suspicious of therapy um i did it primarily to appease my boyfriend but that's another story um and it occurred to me it dawned on me during the process of seeing the shrink, it's like, you know, go, you know, the old like kind of psychoanalytic concept of transference. I mean, sure. everybody does, right? Um, and I think transference for men is oh, I saw saying this. this was wicked. What the tweet you're about to? Quote. Oh yeah, the it, you know, transference for men is, is telling the shrink, "I want to fuck you." Transference for women is asking the shrink, "Do you want to fuck me?" And semantically, it's a slightly different configuration, but it comes down to the same thing. And it's like that John Berger quote that I quote all the time ad nauseum to the point that it's become annoying and my friends won't speak to me because it's all I do is quote this quote all day. Um, men watch, women watch themselves being watched. That's the nature, right? The kind of old traditional basis of female or male versus female sexual arousal. Right. Then, you said this to me, which I thought was very astute. I've never heard anybody else put it this way. Um, yeah, we both come to some version of this independently. Of the same thing. Yeah, it's men are aroused by the woman, the presence of the woman. Women are aroused by the kind of picture of themselves arousing the man. Or that the man some in some ways metaphorically acts as a mirror and the better the man, the better the quality and the more right. flattering the quality of the reflection. Right. And that's not to say that women are completely indifferent to male looks and the like, but that to an enormous extent, we've demonized narcissism when in fact we find narcissism to be an extremely beautiful trait in a future spouse mm -hmm. uh, as men. Mm -hmm. um, and this is this is a very important point too because I'm very much a critic of like kind of narcissism as a generational pathology but uh, that's that I'm critical specifically of kind of the maladjusted pathological manifestations well the maladaptive version the maladaptive that version doesn't not, attach properly to the partner yeah not the not the positive kind of credible um, and this was really wonderfully you know sometimes i feel so awful about myself because i misjudge the situation i'm so used to like people and art and ideas being kind of low density and low nutrition and i'm like kind of starved for stimulation stimulation in that way and sometimes i'll read or see something that i find really remarkable and i always have to ask my myself the question like hey like have my standards plummeted so much or have i grown more tolerant which is, at the end of the day is the same question but uh there was a, a very viral short story on the new yorker by this woman kristen repenian also an armenian by the way um who it was called cat person and in it she describes kind of a, a classic me too type situation where a young college co-ed gets into a relationship with like a kind of older, washed up, thirty eight year old guy, and there's Did a you say older than thirty eight. Well, it's for her because she's like twenty one. Fine, it's okay. You know, I think, <laughs> I think, I think a man. Okay, look, don't my no, don't backpedal. I'm not backpedaling. Okay, uh, I think 
um, kind of the peak manhood is 35 to let's say 55, right? That's a good window. That's when the, the, the male race. I'll give peak, you a shovel yeah. and you can try to dig yourself. Yeah, out I'll of the dig hole. my own grave. That's re- what I really want. I'm like, um, you know, uh, that guy. I fundamentally, I identify with the, the Russian guy in The Sopranos in the Pine Barrens episode. Oh my gosh! Yeah. Don't even get it. Yeah. It's fantastic. But um, basically, Rupenian, she has she crafts this whole sex scene where this girl is like having sex with this guy that she finds profoundly unattractive and undesirable. But what gets her off at the end of the day is her imagining his arousal, her like nubile young body writhing around for him. Uh, and I thought that that was like a, a really brilliant glitch that was, I'm shocked that like, you know, a, a liberal paper of record would publish. It's very odd what gets through these sex. Yeah. Like I watched your description of the wasted opportunity of sexualizing stewardesses. Mm-hmm where everyone has the sense of, oh my God, you know, Pan Am stewardesses in the 60s. Mm-hmm. It's a universal kind of weird beauty norm, but there's now this very strong sense of like, and wasn't that horrible? Mm-hmm. And so the sort of the two-dimensional fantasy of coffee, tea, or me mm-hmm. versus the abject horror of, okay, well, you weren't allowed to compete on price because of the regulation of the airways. Mm -hmm. And so people competed on the sexualization Mm -hmm. of the flight crews. And then some of the flight crews were like actually being oppressed and some of them were self-sexualizing like people do on Instagram because they wanted the attention. And there's no language to pull these things apart. Mm -hmm. Well, as usual, people missed the point of that tweet, which was not about stewardesses. They made it into a labor issue because every, increasingly um, the culture has kind of dried up so much that people increasingly see things through the lens of politics. That tweet wasn't about labor at all. It was actually kind of a very rather subjective indictment of the way that American women behave relative to women elsewhere. Women in Italy, in Thailand, in Spain, in Brazil, in the Middle East, understand that their unofficial power is garnered through indirection, as you say. American women understand no such thing. I mean, Camille Paglia, again, has been beating this drum for decades now. Uh, so th- this was had nothing to do with it. It wasn't like a labor... But it is and it isn't. I mean, this is the, this is the very difficult thing coming from an American context, which is that very often the cultivation of exclusively womanly power Mm -hmm. took place because women did not have alternate options. Yeah. And sometimes we've gone too far in American culture by giving away power that is, uh, you know, entirely functional. So we, you and I both discussed having economics and mathematics in our background, Mm -hmm. the brilliance of Sylvia Nasser's book, a beautiful mind. Mm -hmm. I did not see the film. And you haven't seen the film. No, I well, we'll get back to that in a minute. But okay. Yeah. But, and then we talked about Rebecca Goldstein's The Mind Body Problem. Mm-hmm. In both of these books, you see this very strong hand mm-hmm. of the community of wives of the mostly male mathematicians and economists directing the field who should collaborate with who, who should make up with who, who's having a spat, who should be hired, who mm-hmm. should be invited to the conference. And that kind of there's a question about when women stopped wanting that role in the united states context no one took the role over Mm -hmm. and so it was like a load-bearing role that was now vacant Mm -hmm. um there are ways in which i think it's terrible that nobody's fulfilling that role and there's a ways in which i think it's terrible that women were expected to fulfill that role having now seen fantastic contributions in mathematics, you know, of people um, like Karen Uhlenbeck or Lisa Jeffries, any one of a number of female mathematicians who've, who've put structural things in our world that I can't live without. Right. And so I think that there's a, re- there's a really interesting and rich conversation mm-hmm. about how much power from the old ways should be retained. Mm-hmm. And how much of it should be seeded so that more standard professional accomplishment can occur. And because we're having this very simplistic conversation, we're not getting to the really rich 
conversation, which is what should be the renegotiation of male and female roles around. It shouldn't be that women are trying to be a substitute copy of men. Right. On the other hand, it can't really go back to women hold power and pregnant. Well, I wouldn't say that. No, it's also the terrifying matriarch that the hell that daughters in law are put through in many cultures. You know, it's, it's, it's a very, the, the key issue, and I think this comes through with everything you talk about, the war that we have to wage is the war on simplistic, easy answers as opposed to nuanced richness. Yeah, and well, and this goes back to this question of hyper-normalization where we are grafting, we are affecting, I mean, Angela Nagel talks about this, who I think, Angela's a, a friend of mine, but I think she's also like the, the most brilliant young intellectual around now and she gets kind of pilloried all the time for also being like a reactionary a conservative whatever um nagel talks about this idea that we in her critique of the handmaiden's tale or the handmaid's tale sorry um that we are kind of left fighting the simpler battles of the past that we've grafted this kind of cold war binaristic analogy you know the east versus the west conservative versus progressive or liberal uh, that no longer computes because we live in a bizarre non-linear world with a kind of profusion a superflu a superfluity of information that makes anybody's brain short circuit well you know this is like um what uh our friend uh, amanda fielding the psychedelic countess uh, who extols the virtues of psychedelic chemicals. Hmm. Her point is that the default mode network is this thing that suppresses our brain from experiencing too much. Mm -hmm. And that sanity and um, a well-functioning mind, for the most part, is attached to not perceiving everything that's going on around you. Yeah. And it's selectively kind of maybe subconsciously cherry, pick, cherry picking things that are flattering to, to your you narrative. Other, you know, the, 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 the quantum soup that you and I are currently swimming in can't be perceived. Yeah. We need to perceive a simplified classical world in which, you know, you are a unified person rather than all sorts of subroutines running, you know, simultaneously, some of them conscious, yeah. some of them not. And this is, I think this is the difference between uh, on some level, again, this is all very like improv and stuff, but it, it all kind of goes back, like, folds back on itself. The difference between Russians and Americans is that uh, Russians think that they're a, an intellectual and moral advantage because they perceive all the meta processes, they see the chessboard, but they're actually at a disadvantage fundamentally because they're kind of overly they hyper. They see too much, they feel they too much. They see too much, they feel too much, and they're overly not only critical of the, the, the outside world, but they're hypercritical. And they're fundamentally a self-defeating law on that level. You know, I have to say I have a sadness about some of your views on, on Russia. You, oddly, and I didn't think about this, you are the third out of, I don't know, what is this, my 16th mm -hmm. interview at, at this point. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know when you'll debut, but of, of a Russian background. I had uh, Vitalik uh, of Ethereum Aaron, fame. Yeah. yeah. Gary and you. Th this I knew. I I made a quip to my boyfriend. I was like, you know, I, I was like, oh, I'm going to do the Eric Weinstein, Stein, Weinstein podcast. And uh, it's funny uh, that he chose, you know, Kasparov and Buterin. It's like a, a, you have also some sort of like a psychic Freudian compulsion to you know, draw to i care about meaning yeah to, to be honest russia and the soviet i mean there are places that just are pregnant mm -hmm. with meaning with meaning yeah and there's a ton that i hate about that world and i think i talked to you about it, the barbell society mm -hmm. with the lowest of the low and the highest of the high mm -hmm. um but i chose to retain this culture I mean, you know, it was my grandparents on one side and my great grandparents on another mm -hmm. who came over. So I'm a little bit deeper in this thing than you are mm -hmm. because you were born there. Mm -hmm. I don't want to give it up. And I work, I work my ass off to retain it, even mm -hmm. to the point of learning a tiny bit of Russian just to deal with Russian relatives that who were rediscovered when the Soviet Union came apart. We thought it had all been wiped out in the mm -hmm. Holocaust. You're going to have to work your ass off 
to keep that connection. I and I intend to have many more Russians, many South Asians, many mm -hmm. people from very particular places. I have the utmost reverence, for example, for the UK and the genius of Spain and Italy. Yeah. There are these particular places that are just incredibly pregnant. Well, Spain and Italy, I mean, are wonderful because they're, you know, every once in a while I'll go to Italy or Spain and you'll be like at a little cafe, like an outdoor cafe, and they'll serve you, they'll give you some free shit with your coffee. They'll give you like a little biscuit or a croissant. It's a really weird model because the thing that makes them economically unviable, that makes them kind of fundamentally obsolete to the neoliberal system is also the thing that makes them morally redeemable. But it's also an unabashed, look, Russia is a genius-based culture. In what way? That you revere uh, the Lev Landau's, you revere you know, the Rachmaninoffs. You yeah, but this is, I think that this is um, a, a thing that is dying now because the, the last 30 or 40, how long has it been? It's been 40 years now since the Soviet Union collapsed. The last 30 something years, the, the last several decades of privatization, I think have been much harder on the Russian psyche than the 70 odd years or so of but like we're all communist. getting worse at this yeah but it i think that this is slowly waning you know russia was was known basically for its educational system for its uh, athletic programs and no more right yeah but some of these things were bizarre um everybody's getting less genius that's true and also not true who's getting more in a really profound way in a profound way. I mean, that's a good question. I, I have to, I'll get back to you on that. I'm just saying everybody's taking a huge hit at the moment. It's like we, mm -hmm. we, we started belching out lead exhaust from leaded gasoline. The, the IQ of the world functionally is getting dumber and dumber and dumber. Like since the medieval era, I mean, people no. frown upon the middle ages as like, you know, they're not called the dark ages for nothing, but people reached a, a really high pinnacle of achievement. I mean, I in, listen to music those, from back then. Yeah, yeah. Those, I do too, and I don't even like music. I mean, I do, but I have like a very kind of uh, one dimensional hobbyists sensibility. I'm not like a musician or a composer, Yeah, but yeah, I think the whole, but I think this is due kind of to the proliferation of information technologies, uh, the, the triumph of, of the internet. And you look at Me Too, Me Too is the nexus of uh, kind of the imperatives, the market imperatives of the internet and the triumph of feminism. It wouldn't have had, feminists are very fond of saying that we live in a patriarchy. If we lived in a patriarchy, there would be no viral online movement called Me Too. The fact is, you know, now in this day and age, women are the cultural brokers and gatekeepers. And they're not doing that great of a job. I mean, not, I want yeah. Hedy Lamar back. I, yeah. And it has, know, yeah. I, I, I was going to write this book about Marie Curie called Radium Slut. Mm hmm. And it was about the, it was going to be about the prohibition of her to come to Stockholm for her second Nobel because she was getting stripped by a married guy. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, you know, my favorite story in physics is Madame Wu who figured out the asymmetry of the weak force in the cobalt 60 mm -hmm. uh, beta decay in, in an electromagnetic field. I want those amazing, hot, sexy, brilliant chicks back yeah that and, they don't exist that's why that's why you know there's a cultural fixation on russian women because only in russia or like in the russian amniotic fluid can you find a woman who has like a phd in philology or linguistics but looks like a supermodel and is great in the sack and knows the powers of seduction well this, this is the, uh, this is like the super dangerous thing in there's a way of saying that's a little bit less fun than what you say. I, mm -hmm. I love listening to you, but I also like not being nailed to a cross when when yeah, when, yeah. when when the, this debuts to the audience. Yeah, which is to say that the cultures that 
where women enjoy self-feminizing mm-hmm. but don't see this as competitive with intellectual achievement mm-hmm. yes russia and to some extent eastern europe is one mm-hmm. but east asia is also yes, in this idiom. i think those are the two big ones yeah um and i would love to talk to you about all manners of dangerous disgusting horrible <laughs> vile and illegal things yeah um but I hope you'll accept an invitation to come back through the portal yeah. when you're uh, next out in LA. Uh-huh. And um, thank you for showing up and just bringing a side yeah. that maybe not everybody's seen before. That's horrifying. I'm very happy to do it. I'm happy to chat. Anyway, thank you for having me. Well, I'm sorry to horrify you. It was no, did you, to wait, ha- do you get a buzzer that tells you when the time? No. Okay. I'm just sort of thinking that you've got this happening party to go to. Oh, okay. That's and I want to be respectful okay. of your time yeah, because yeah. I'd, otherwise I'd completely monopolize you till the cows yeah. come home. Yeah, yeah. No, it's fine. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> you've been through the portal with Anna <laughs> Hachian. 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 Uh, please check out the Red Scare podcast. Come with an open mind uh, and uh, hopefully don't give her too much grief unless that's good for building her audience. Um with respect to the portal, uh, please subscribe on Apple, Stitcher, Spotify, wherever you listen to podcasts, and also navigate over to our YouTube channel, where uh, if you'll subscribe and click the bell, you'll be notified of any upcoming episodes. And uh, all the best. Be well.